How's it going, everyone, and welcome to the Bot Podcast, where we interview movers, shakers, and innovators and talk all things conversational user interfaces. I'm your host, Chad Oda, and today we're very privileged to have Jeff McPherson. Jeff is the founder and CEO of Direct Heroes, based out of Ontario, Canada. Direct Heroes is an Instagram-first chatbot and CRM system. Direct Heroes changes the way you communicate with your loyal Instagram followers. Jeff previously started a smartphone case e-commerce company, which has successfully scaled to customers worldwide, in addition to getting into the hands of uh, several NHL players. You know, so at that, Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So um, before we get into sort of more nitty gritty chatbot oriented <laughs> questions, I always like to sort of ask a unique question to our guests. So since you're sort of running two companies right now, yep. one you've successfully scaled and one that's really about to get some breakout attention and success here. You know, so for a lot of the entrepreneurs just watching this podcast, you know, like, do you have any like tips or suggestions as far as time management? Because that's something that's always in short supply for budding entrepreneurs that are just trying to figure out, you know, how to run one company, let alone two. Um, what I've done from the beginning, because I never had a ton of money to just start these businesses and um, do them from there. So I had my goal on what I wanted to do in terms of running a business and what the product or service was. And as I continue to grow the companies out, I leveraged what I had to bring other team members on board. So um, for the phone cases, I was able to leverage the product to um, help with marketing, which then continued to grow from there. Then we could get into more marketing. Same thing with the software and direct heroes is I've got a product now. So as we continue to add more team members to the platform, people are excited to work with us. So it's just a matter of trading what you have to what they have to build each other's assets. So I don't have to sit there and do all the work myself. There's people out there that are willing to do the work for you, work for you. And if you can find those, those people willing to kind of use their expertise and use your platform or your expertise, that's when people grow together and that's when companies and people can be extremely successful. It's just a matter, it's just a matter of leveraging what you have and leveraging your assets and combining. This is where partnerships and teams come into play especially in early startup stages when there's not a lot of funding there. Absolutely. I think that's an incredible point. You know, so, you know, definitely look into strategic partnerships, figure out how you can create sort of a mutual value share and, uh, you know, really leverage that uh, in your initial growth engine. I think that's a really great advice. So yeah, no, of, it's, it's good. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, like it's a testament uh, to what you're doing right now. So, you know, I think that's always uh, really encouraging, you know, especially when we're sort of talking about more emergent technology like chatbots, for example, you know, so I think maybe that's a good segue to my first question here, you know, so with Direct Heroes, you know, maybe talk a little bit about what it is and also what's the customer need, what's the market opportunity for that company? Well, for me, because I started the smartphone case on Instagram, so it was, I was never, I was never a marketer in the beginning, so I went to a platform that I knew and started leveraging my product to get to the market. So that's when I really started understanding the platform. And then once I started getting into the digital products, just because I knew there was a higher demand for digital products and tech as, as we, like as society grows, um, I was able to, um, what am I trying to say? Sorry. Um, I just grew a brain fart there. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, yeah. Can you go over the question one more time? Sorry. Oh yeah, no worries. Um, you know, so maybe just sort of talk about the, you know, specific company, you know, and what was sort of the customer need sort of market opportunity that you guys are sort of interested in addressing right now. Yeah, sorry. So um, starting on Instagram, learning the platform, understanding how that was, I started to see the trends in the chatbot marketplace on Facebook, especially um, me being again, that expert in the Instagram side, I was able to take the two expertise that I have and start building a team on the tech side, which then we're able to leverage to where we are now. And there's a lot of Facebook bot developers out there and a lot of people that want to get onto the Instagram side. So in terms of that first question that you had is we have developers, bot builders coming to us every day saying, we want to work with you. How do we work with you? So it, the, the demands is crazy, which is great. 
Um, but it's a matter of finding those strategic partners to help leverage the business and grow the business in the right direction, not just growing it for the sake of making a whole bunch of money. Because what I was, I was having a call with our team yesterday and the, my customers are actually the followers and users on Instagram. It's not the people using the platform because the more people we can have talking to the chatbots and really interacting with them, the more benefit the business on my platform are going to do, the more benefit that I'm going to have as the, the mother company. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I guess, first of all, I'll just say, you know, I, I, I know certainly, you know, Jeff, you must be just grinding, you know, working both companies. So, you know, I, I certainly empathize. And if you're running on a low amount of sleep, you know, I actually just pulled an all nighter as well. So I, I, I totally on the same page as you, man. Um, yeah. And my partner for the phone case company flew up the last couple of days because yeah. we're, uh, we're doing something a little bit different now. So we're shooting some content. So the last couple of days have been busy trying to bounce back and forth from onboarding calls and team meetings and both companies. Yeah. So you can run on a little bit of sleep, but it's a matter of just finding the time, have a quick 15, 20 minute power nap and keep going. <laughs> no, absolutely. I'm definitely going to be doing that after this podcast here. Yeah. But no, absolutely. I think that's a very prudent point, right? It's like, especially on the early stages right now, you guys already see the market opportunity, right? It's not trying to like nickel and dime, you know, everyone from the start, right? Because you see that the value right now to people that are not only leveraging a platform, but their end users is like so immense, right? So it's just about how can we create the most value right now and create that audience that is really passionate and motivated and wants to hype your product up. Um, but I also think, you know, to that extent, um, from a market opportunity perspective, you know, I, I think this has just been like a platform. People have been asking, when are we going to get automation? You know, are we going to get chatbots? And, you know, I think it's super exciting that you guys decided, you know, not seeing like everyone else or other companies trying to do this. You guys are like, hey, you know, we're going to try this and we're going to see if we can make this happen. Um, is I know that you had said, you know, on a previous conversation that, you know, you're actually working with some of the people that, you know, had either, you know, work for some of these companies or have sort of expertise, you know, so I think there is a real interest in sort of maybe bringing these capabilities to light. Um, you know, we saw something similar with WhatsApp, right? People ask for the longest time and then finally WhatsApp goes and opens their APIs, but you guys are really sort of pioneers specifically with Instagram. So I think that's really cool. Yeah. So I hired my first developer in 2016 in December. So two years before that real trend of Instagram chatbots, I guess, are starting to really become demanding. Yeah. Um, we've, I've spent a lot of time trying to discuss with people at Instagram and Facebook engineers specifically trying to get the, um, talking to people at policy and stuff like that to really start building the relationships there and to explain that what we're trying to do, how we're trying to do it. Because on Instagram, it's about the followers and keeping people back to the, um, coming back to your accounts and engaging. So it's not about just sending messages all the time. It's about communicating and collaborating with them because a lot of these followers, all they want, to, all they want is to be heard. And with these big influencers, let's say, or businesses, they're not able to stay in touch with, with their customers or followers because without them, we don't have, none of us have businesses on Instagram. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I always, I thought it was really interesting that on your landing page, you have the quote from Gary Vaynerchuk, right? Because it's sort of a, you know, definitely aligned to the, to the last thing you said, right? It's just like, you know, there's such an opportunity to engage with followers, right? But, you know, at a certain extent, it's, it's sometimes like not even feasible, right? So you see Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, responding back or at least trying to, to like the hundreds of thousands of messages this guy gets, right? So yeah. I, I think it's, it's maybe you know, maybe some validation, you know, that this is something that could really benefit, you know, influencers, brands, small businesses alike. Um, yeah. It's just a matter of doing it in the, in the right way, yeah. um, talking to them the right way, not making it so promotional because with, with messaging and this is on the Facebook side as well, it's a long-term play because yeah. people on, in, people on Instagram, their followers, you don't actually own that, own those, that list, let's say. So we can start bringing in their, their information about them and start learning more about our followers and how they interact with you. And let's say for an e-commerce store, how much they spend, you're really going to know what your customer and follower does and how they interact on a day to day. So you can start customizing stuff for those audiences as well. Absolutely. You know, and I think Instagram couldn't be a better platform for that. So, you know, just speaking about Instagram and speaking about chat bots, um, 
sort of a good, you know, um, segue to my next question here. You know, how did you initially even get interested in chatbots, right? What, what was that like sort of thought process for you? Like, were you aware of them for some time or was it sort of like you more so saw the opportunity and benefit from an automation perspective and it just sort of made sort of natural sense, you know, to take that on Instagram? I was always on computers yeah. in tech of some sort my whole life, always designing, developing something. Um, and then again, when I started the smartphone case, went on Instagram, but the influx of messages that I was getting, it just kind of was one of those that you just don't really know about the possibilities, yeah. but keeping up with them looking back now was kind of crazy. So when, when I got into the digital products and started learning about all that in terms of services, um, I thought, well, it would be kind of cool to do like email marketing, like follow-up sequences. So each day a new message goes out. But then I started learning about the chat bots, the Facebook messenger bots and stuff like that. And like, no, this makes more sense in terms of communication. So I started developing it in terms of a follow-up sequence before I turned it into a chat bot. So it's evolved quite a few times. But now what we're doing is we're just taking the models that are already out there, the proven the proven platforms and we're just re-engineering it onto a platform that we understand better as as owners yeah no absolutely i think i think that's the most pragmatic way to especially go about building chatbots you know so i was actually talking to a another startup yesterday and essentially they cater towards e-commerce clients in the sort of mid-market enterprise space and essentially when they're talking to their, their pre-existing customers or install based customers you know, they're saying, hey, you know, we already have like these sequences and sort of flows built out in Clavio. You know, how do we do that in chatbots? You know, and I think similarly, you're taking that very pragmatic approach of saying like, okay, let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's see what sort of sequences or some sort of, you know, processes, you know, from a automation perspective that's working on email or maybe other channels. And let's figure out like, what's that one-to-one -one on Instagram leveraging some sort of chatbot. So I, I think that's really interesting. Exactly. And I think a, a lot of, a lot of the, hard work has been put in by these Facebook companies and there's been a lot of testing for them. So we're going to have that benefit of yeah. networking, working with the right developers, bot builders to kind of speed up that process to make that more engaging, more exciting for the Instagram user, follower, fan, because they don't necessarily have to be a follower, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that that is a, uh, that makes total sense and is really interesting just the sort of path you took to get here. You know, so I, I sort of want to pivot to, going back to what you're saying where it's just like, hey, no one's done this before. So maybe if you don't mind talking about some of like the initial challenges, right? Not only, you know, there's like no best practices that exist, right? So you're sort of having to move, move this down the line, like inch by inch. Um, you know, so maybe talk about some of those initial challenges and maybe how you sort of face them and, uh, you know, what's that sort of looking like? Well, in the beginning, it was the whole, okay, I've got an idea. I hired a developer. Let's go at it. So bootstrapping it in the beginning, we got to a point where we had some sort of working pre-beta product that we could sell, to, I could sell to a network that I already built. So I started selling it pre-beta. If people wanted to use it, they were paying for it because if I gave it to people for free in the beginning, it was inevitable there was going to be bugs. Something was going to happen. But if people paid for it, I knew that I was going to have their at least full, full attention for that month. And then we, I, could, I just took the time and work with these people one-on-one -on -one with me and my developers to work out any issues and help them optimize as much as possible. Now we still have people from that, those day one using the platform. So over a year pre-beta still using the platform, which is great. And that's just because I put in, I was in the trenches. I was just putting in the time. And again, that's leveraging something that I have and I had the time to sit there and do it. Now it's coming to, okay, now I've got to put my time somewhere else. Now you bring on people who can, do that. And with saying that is I learned the best practices that I can then better, I can give to my team. That was one hurdle was <clears throat> bootstrapping the whole thing, but I started charging people from, from day one. Another thing is like, I never was, never have been one of those flashy marketer sellers do everything behind the scenes. I like to build those strong personal relationships with people like yourself and then kind of leverage it out that way because then we, again, we all succeed. So when I was out, cold outreaching to people trying to introduce what I was doing and stuff like that, especially in the early stages of chat bots, especially on Instagram, there was, Oh, that's not allowed. Don't know who you are. Don't really care. So again, it was just putting in the time, jumping on calls, giving people more of my time than I needed of theirs and 
just be impatient. So it's it, it, patience. Patience was was the was the biggest hurdle in all. Because would I've liked to have started selling this to the thousands last year? Absolutely. But I think it would have ended up destroying the brand and the company in the long run because the amount that I've learned since then has been a lot more powerful. And now I've got the right team, the right partners, and the right um, customers and clients and stuff like that underneath me that we can really grow and grow in the proper direction. No, I think those are all really, really you know, valid points. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people can learn from some of those things, right? It's just like, you know, I, and I think that the interesting thing is like, you know, we had met, must have been like, what, three months ago over I think beginning of August or something. Yeah. You know, to your point, it's like, you're doing a lot of cold outreach. You're trying to create value for people out there, you know, just to talk to them in the chatbot space or the voice space, because, you know, even, you know, six months in this space is like a lifetime at this point, right? There's so many things that happen, right? From the time that we spoke to the time, you know, you have yeah. a product now and it's in beta and you have customers, you know, so I think that's just really incredible. So on the other side of things, right? So we're talking about challenges now, you know, on the other side, what were some of the initial successes that you saw early on that were really encouraging where it was like, okay, you know, I think we have something here, even though there's a bunch of ambiguity as far as rules and regulations and, you know, no one's done this before, you know, what were like some of those initial wins that really like captivated you and your team? Um, in the beginning, like it was, it was just me for the longest time. So that yeah. self-motivation was a lot tougher in the early stages, but Again, another reason why I started charging from the beginning, because no matter what business you start, when you get a sale, it's rewarding. So it's able to keep pushing yourself to that next sale. When's that next sale coming? How do we make it quicker? How do we optimize it better for the customer? So I was using people coming in and their excitement to drive my own excitement. So even if, I, even if there was um, bugs in the system or things weren't working properly or the, the communication wasn't as open as, the, as they wanted. They still, at the end of the day, when I gave them that time and really helped them out, they could say, this is a really good platform. I was just using other people's excitement to then drive my own motivation to continue to go, especially in those dark times, because as business owners, we know there's the ups and downs. And in the beginning, there's a lot more downs than there is ups and they're inevitable. They're going to come. So it's a matter of, again, leveraging what you have to self-motivate yourself to continue to go in those, in those worst times. And that's just how I did it. And I truly love what I do. I love helping people and their businesses. I didn't create this business for myself. I did it because I wanted to sell people back time, the most valuable commodity, because that's why I started working for myself anyways. I wanted to have that time freedom from now till whenever I stop working, which will probably never happen. So I wanted to be able to sell people back their time, which then everybody benefits from because we all deserve a, a good life. And the more time you have and the more money you have in your pocket, you're able to do so. Absolutely. No, I, I, uh, I love it. Um, so, you know, speaking of, right, some initial successes, let's sort of take this out and project it out like, you know, over the course of the next two years, five years, you know, for you, <laughs> What's your sort of vision for the company? You know, do you have sort of an exit strategy in mind? You know, or is it sort of more organic? Um, what's sort of that like? Yeah, we've talked, so um, my partner and I, we've talked about exit strategies. Um, I think they're extremely important, whether you, wanna, if you, whether you wanna exit or not, because like you said, six months in the tech world is, feels like a lifetime. So what could happen in 12 months? What can happen in 24 months? What could happen in five years? You don't really know, but planning for it's important. So. We're just willing, we just want to work with the right people. We don't need millions of people using the platform. We'd rather have thousands of people that stay day in, day out, love the platform. Because that, again, to me, that's more successful than having more people in, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. So in terms of the success in the long term, yeah, we have an exit strategy that that's, I think that's every tech company's plan at some point I think it's important to have there but again it's just a matter of building the platform having those relationships there and really building out the best possible platform for those users of ours yeah no absolutely I think that makes complete sense um, you know especially since there's just so many opportunities right now in the space right whether you want to build out service company you know do managed services for the long haul 
you know, certainly there's many opportunities right now for acquisition targets by some of the larger, larger incumbent companies like Live Person and Google and Microsoft, et cetera. Um, it's it's so hard to say what can happen in the, in the next, next six, 12 months, but yeah. like we have our, we have our goals in mind, short term, monthly, quarterly, like half year, year. It's just, okay, now let's just go for those goals. If you, yeah. if you can, if you can nail them, great. If it takes a bit longer, that's all right. That's, that could happen. That probably will happen, but you adjust to the, to those. And it's just taking it. It's just, it's, there's taking, it's the time patience point. It's like, you still have to take it day in and day out because in tech things can change extremely quick yeah. and in businesses. So day in and day out, but have those weekly, monthly, quarterly goals. And then you're having your plan. If what, if there is an exit, you got to plan for that as well. Whether you, whether you want to or not, I think it's extremely important to have that there. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so maybe sort of transitioning from, you know, um, the product and solution right now to more sort of a broad conversation about just the ecosystem of chatbots from your opinion. Um, have you used like an experience, whether it be voice or a chatbot that you thought was like really great just from your opinion? Have I personally gone through one? Or have you found an experience that you thought was like really compelling and, and really good? Because right now I think throughout the ecosystem, right, there's a lot of bad experiences. There's a lot of, there's some decent experiences. And then you find like these like diamonds in the rough that are just really good experiences. Yeah. So actually I connected with um, a customer through a group. I can't remember where. Yeah. So they're, they're using the uh, Direct Heroes platform now and we're working pretty closely with them. They do a lot of nonprofit. Um, so actually what this, this is one of the best chatbots that I've seen. And basically what it was, it was a nonprofit to raise money for, um, like, uh, young children in these third world countries to get them food, water, give them schooling, stuff like that. And basically what it was is the backstory of this, this little girl. So each day you would get something new, you would get voice notes from her and it was from her personally. And it was just like, it felt like you were actually sitting there connected to that girl from halfway across the world. So it's that, it's that emotional connection as well as that engaging connection as well. It was one of the best chatbots that I've ever been to because I, again, I felt like that little girl was just sitting right beside me telling her story about how different it is than what we have in terms of being in North America, because we're extremely privileged and I think we take advantage of that. So seeing something like that and how chatbots are able to leverage again people from that aren't as fortunate as we can be was extremely emotional i think because you i could just feel it which is extremely extremely rewarding to me because it's like okay how can we reverse engineer this and put it on instagram because i think it could be more powerful in terms of a visual um, campaign on instagram with getting into stories and then visually seeing it on the timeline and having people walk through this, this little girl's experience through that. It's more of a storyboard than an actual conversation. Yeah, definitely. I, I think, um, I think that's a great use case because I think right now it's like, you know, there, this paradigm shift for conversation has occurred, but I think it's like not staying too, you know, aligned to previous tactics, but trying to figure out, what's like the native content or native experience on these new channels, right? What are the benefits, you know, of taking advantage of a more intimate channel like Instagram direct messaging or Facebook messenger? And, you know, what are some of the different experiences that we can begin surfacing out of that? So I think that's a really interesting use case. Um, I know there was a recent uh, use case where there's like an author that's like trying to extend their book by having maybe something similar, it's having sort of a side story in messenger. And, you know, using those type of, you know, different elements like videos or audio that can make things a lot more really, a lot more compelling, you know, I think. So, you know, I, I think that's, um, I think that's really incredible because I think the more people that are sort of pushing the boundaries and sort of thinking outside of the box, instead of just saying, you know, let's take, you know, like an email campaign and just duplicate that in Facebook Messenger or Instagram, yeah. right? Because I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, I don't think it works. I don't think it works. I don't think like there's templates. Yes. But every audience, every business, especially on Instagram, everybody listens in a different way. Yeah. So the good thing with Instagram and their stories and their stickers, and you can ask your followers what they want, want from you. 
they'll tell you what they want. Just give them what they want. Instead, it's not about what we want to give them. It's a matter of what they want us to give them. And people, I think people overlook that because in the end of the day, yes, it's a business and sales are important, but if people go for the long-term play and they can really be patient about it, the rewards on the bigger scale, I think are, are better for us. Yeah, definitely. That, that raises a really interesting point, you know, because I think especially on these type of platforms, Instagram in particular, I think there's an opportunity to just be more authentic with that user base. And yeah. with that opportunity, you know, I think the brands that are going to make it are going to be the ones that, you know, are willing to inquire with that audience. And I actually heard a really interesting quote actually from a friend of mine that was speaking at Chatbot Summit uh, two weeks ago. So he's running this company designed around conversational UX. And he had said he thinks the companies that are really going to create an impact are the ones that are going to be able to, you know, um, sort of apologize or the ones that are going to, you know, when let's say the content they push out is not what the audience wants, you know, and I think there's that availability now provided, you know, the channel and some of the things that you're doing to have that more one-to-one -one connection and sort of, instead of like having like this, like a hundred mile away interaction with this brand on, you know, seeing like on a website or an ad unit somewhere that's super impersonal. So um, I, I thought what you were saying, maybe sort of connected to that. Yeah, no, it can. And like, it was funny with the Instagram stories and all that and the lives and then the IGTV now, like there's so many different ways that you can emotionally connect to your following. So I'm not a big reader, never have been, but I came across somebody's story and they were a writer, they were a writer and what they actually did and it locked me right in is they took their stories and it was like 10 or 15 um, stories right in a row. But each story that came up was something more emotional that connected to me. It was, it was obviously niched down in like the business world and it was connecting in terms of like patience and the ups and downs and stuff like that. But something like that as well, when you get to the end of the story, you can enter into campaigns where you're connecting more on a one-on-one -on -one level because I was instantly connected to the person because I ended up reaching out. I was like, would love to do, do some work with you. Never heard back, but power of direct messaging. All you can do is all you can do is try because it was emotionally connected. It's like, okay, if I'm reaching out, how many other people of the thousands of followers are doing the same? Probably a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. So you know, maybe hopefully they they use your platform, you know, next time so you get a response back or something like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, no, um, you know, so I, I think something else just in the chatbot space, you know, I'm I'm sure you probably experience this more than most people, but really identifying what are the obstacles and challenges right now? You know, so when I think about your platform and I know we had previous conversations where you're saying, you know, so right now there's not really a native, a native true chat experience on Instagram, right? As far as making the comparison to messenger, right? Where we have quick replies and we have buttons and we have galleries, you know, so whether it be a challenge with the platform itself, as far as like the native capabilities that are being surfaced, or whether it be, you know, what sort of, you know, NLP solutions that you guys have to leverage like Dialogflow or Microsoft Lewis or IBM Watson. Um, in addition to maybe it could be like sort of a conversational UX thing, right? A lot of best practices um, as far as copywriting really haven't been established. So what are the top obstacles just within the ecosystem um, do you see that are most pressing? Um, yeah, there's the quick reply buttons. That's, that's the first one everybody asks about. No, we don't have them. I don't think because it's not like we're the only one who doesn't have quick reply buttons yeah. on Instagram. We're just, we're the, like nobody does. So yeah. it's not, like we're competing against other people and we're, we're behind them. So that's, that's one benefit I try and keep in the back of my head. It's like, well, we're not, we're, it's not like we're the only ones not doing it. It's just not the case. I think if people reply, like, yes, there's the, the friction there where if people press the button, it's a lot, it's a lot quicker. But if somebody types a reply to me, they're more interested in what you're trying to offer. Yes, there's the, there's the friction there. It's time and stuff like that. But it's kind of, again, more of that relationship building was like, if they're giving you their time, you should be able to give them their time. But if it's quick people, it's kind of like getting rid of the tire kickers. Yeah. That's kind, of, that's kind of how we're looking at it because it's, it's one of those things. You try and keep it as simple as possible for the end user because that's just important. But you got to get rid of the, the tire kickers as much as possible because that's just going to help your business as well. But you got to work with what, what you're given. Yeah. And, that's, and that's what we're doing. So is it a hurdle? Maybe. I don't think it is because people reply all the time. 
it's really not that difficult to send a message and people are doing it. And that's just what the, the Instagram platform is allowing us to do. And that's how we're looking at it. We're not, we're, we're trying not to, we're comparing ourselves to um, the Facebook messenger bots because that's the models we're, we're doing, but sure. we're also trying not to compare them to them because Instagram and Facebook is completely different. Yeah. It's a different demographic completely. Absolutely. So, so there's the two sides of it. There's the pros and cons, just like in, just like in anything, but we're working with what, what we're given. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really prudent point, you know, because I think right now, I think it's more about figuring out how to operate within the limitations of the current ecosystem, right? Whether that be a platform, whether that be natural language processing limitations there with context management or, you know, conversational UX, right? It's trying to figure out how do we best position ourselves provided those limitations, which sometimes are actually opportunities. Yeah. Right? So and that's, and that's why I'm just working so closely with everybody right now in the early stages, because again, like every business and every conversation should be different. It, yeah. I don't think the, the whole take a template and use it. Yeah. It can work in the beginning, but your business is like even a pizza shop. They all run differently. <laughs> yeah. They all run differently across. Yeah, there's some there's some capabilities where you can you can automate stuff and it's it's pretty straightforward, like ordering a pizza. People just want to do it the exact same way. But keeping the <coughs> the interaction there, because we look at it in four types of ROI. There's the subscribers, those are the people that are entering your bots. There's the followers, if you get them after they subscribe or if they're followers before. So there's two sides of that. And then there is the engagement, keeping your engagement, increasing your engagement. And then and that with those three, sales will come. If you can keep those increasing, sales will come. So kind of working backwards on it. Yeah, no, no, I think that's a really, I think that's a really smart way to look at it. You know, I think a lot of people right now in the space, you know, if I were to ask them that question, right, how are you thinking about this from an ROI standpoint? I'm not, I'm sure that a lot of them would not be able to answer that question. So I, I think you have a very pragmatic approach to, you know, hey, let's start small, let's spend time and energy and really understand what our customers want. And then from that, you know, then we can really build a compelling solution. So I, I really like that approach. Um, you know, so sort of moving more towards, you know, the ecosystem as a whole, right? Because I think everything is going conversational, right? I think it's incremental steps, but what's your sort of vision you know, in five years, like what does the conversational ecosystem look like? Um, just in your opinion. I think it, like voice will come over text. That's, I think that's almost a guaranteed. Yeah. Um, but th for me, like, I don't know if I'm just one of those people, but I prefer not to get voice. I prefer to get text. Yeah. So it's, again, it's hard to say five years down the road, could there could be so much things that are developed in five years that it's hard to predict what could come at that time. So again, like, yeah, we need to look into the future voice definitely, but more artificial intelligence. Yeah. Because like in five years, there could be something a little bit more virtual Yeah, in terms of um, like a more personal something. So videos that come out that are personal to each subscriber that come through that, like you've got this influencer, this business speaking to you, like they're sitting in front of you, like we are right now. Yeah. There's so many things that, and I think all this stuff is coming. It's just a matter of what that timeline is. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think all those points make a lot of sense, you know, because I think the way that people like yourself and, you know, people that I've talked to sort of think about it is that like the medium is no longer really going to be that relevant, right? It's what's going to be relevant is the message right now. Now, you know, if you sort of think about it within that constraint, right. Or, that opportunity, right? It's just like people will want to engage on the platform they want to engage on, right? And, and you know, I think if we begin to reduce the restrictions on how that engagement is facilitated, you know, especially with the advent of conversational user interfaces, right? Now it's like, it doesn't really matter, right? Because it's across every medium and now it's like very seamless and hopefully a lot, you know, less friction is involved. And at that point, I think it's going to be an entirely different way that we're interacting. Um, you know, to your point, right, it could be video, it could be, you know, conversations over voice or conversations over, um, you know, a chat bot or something like that. So yeah, because the, th the thing with it is, is it comes down to the end user and not the end user of direct heroes itself, the follower that's going through the account, because me, I prefer text. Yeah. Um, if somebody sends me if somebody keeps sending me voice, 
I'm not going to be as interested. If it's text, I can read it and I'll reply. Right. But if it's voice, majority of the time, if somebody sends me voice through messaging and something like that, I won't listen to it just because just I'm doing other things. You've got to actually put it up to your ear. It's for, and I don't want like to have headphones in all the time or don't want it to be on speakerphone. So if I can read a text and I can reply. So it's just giving the person at the end user what they want. Maybe somebody wants video. So yep. give the people video. Right. So it's, it's again, it's, it's defining what the end user wants, not what we want to give them. Exactly. If you could set it up in different ways, some people get text, some people get voice, some people get videos. That's what they should get. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're rapidly sort of approaching that, you know, the, the buzzword people like to say is multimodality, but I think that's where we're sort of going. And uh, yeah. you know, it's cool, cool to meet other people that definitely are sort of seeing that same sort of evolution within the next several years here. Um, so, you know, as far as, you know, uh, present term, right, present tense here, um, you know, I think a lot of people are looking for best practices or sort of advice. Do you have like any specific best practices that you've learned so far that um, you could share with our audience today, whether it be on the technical side of things, conversational UX side of things or platform specific? Um, I think um, all of those points or they could be incredibly beneficial. It's, it's, that's, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, like it's, it comes down to patience on yeah. all the platforms. I know all entrepreneurs, all influencers, they talk about, you got to be patient and we all have it to an extent, but sometimes we'd wish it would be more. So if a customer comes on, I try and get them to look at it, like reverse engineer it. So go through and see what your conversations have done. This is from an actual platform and user standpoint, see what conversations you've done because the majority of people don't have the same conversations over and over, especially if they're pitching something. So take that and how can we, how can we change it a bit differently? Okay, we can do that. So it takes time to set that stuff up and then going there and asking questions on what type of additional content would they like? You set up stories, you let it run for 24 hours. You do it again, you kind of ask different questions and you start collecting that data from your followers where then we go out building the actual campaigns itself aren't that tough, yeah. but building a campaign that people like interact with and continue to interact with. That's the thing that takes time. So if we, it's just like cooking or baking, it's the prep work that takes time. It's not actually the cooking or baking itself. And I think that's, that's for any business, any like marketing campaign, something like that. The more prep work you do in the beginning, the easier it will be once you start doing it. And even people coming onto the platform, if people aren't ready on Instagram, I just like, you don't need to sign up. Like there's no point. Yeah. You're just set up your business, get it structured, come on. Because I look at it as, as well as if they're not ready, it's going to take away from my time that I have to spend on support with them because they're not ready. But yeah. if they, they take the time before they set it up, then they join. It's like, okay, this is how you do it. Go and set it up. And then it's good. And now not only is there no problems with the platform itself and how it functionally works, I keep them as a, a customer month after month after month. Just because I say, take your time in the beginning, start doing the prep work. When you're ready, we can go over it. Then we'll get you signed up. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, it's a, uh, I think it's a really great methodology, right? It's uh, you know, I, I think as time goes on, right. I think we will begin to see, you know, sort of higher level best practices emerge, but, you know, I think it's a really valid point. You know, I think, you know, it just hasn't been enough time for people to succeed or conversely for people to fail. Right. And from all of that aggregate, right. It's like those learnings that we can take from that. Right. So I think it's a really great point. You know, let's be patient, let's test things and sort of iterate off of those things. That I, th we I think a lot of people run into the issue of they're looking at other people's success and trying to duplicate it just like templates. Like it's not easily duplicatable. It's just, you just, it's just life. Yeah. So going in at your own practice. And I think me not having funding, not having all that additional stuff in the beginning, I really learned these practices really in depth because now, now I just, I live by them yeah. in, any, in anything that I do, but I had a conversation. So <clears throat> we're looking, to, we were looking to um, raise some money for development, marketing, stuff like that, just because in tech, it's just, Really, you got to hit the market, hit the market hard. So you just want to make sure that the logistics side of it's covered as well as support and the marketing. Anyways, it's just like, well, at this time, and this was this was before, 
do you, do you need funding right now? Like, what is that money going to do for you? It's like, well, we still need to continue to build out this stack of developers. So it's, it's there. And it's not like we had a whole bunch of candidates lined up. So it was like, it was that additional few months that we had to be patient before even worrying about that, that fund, because then you've got investors and more partners and a whole bunch of money sitting there where people looking to get money back instead of, okay, well, let's give it a month or two. Let's get the foundation of the platform, the prep work done. And then after that, it's just going for it. Yeah, definitely. I, I, uh, I completely agree with you hundred percent. I really think it is the most like practical way to go about things, right? Let's not rush things, right? Things take time and, uh, you know, we'll see slow incremental gains, you know, and it'll lead and culminate up to something uh, a lot greater. Yeah. Uh, to that point, um, you know, I think you sort of mentioned uh, maybe a couple things that you guys are looking to do now, raise money. You know, so at this point, I just want to give you the stage, you know, let people know, you know, what's going on, you know, what updates, you know, you guys may have in the next, you know, couple months where they can meet you, where they can maybe see you speak. Um, floor is yours. Yeah, like right now we're at the, we're, the company is, again, early stages, so we're open for partnerships, collaborations in any form because, again, we want, me as an owner, I want to make the customers happy, which then we work with the right partnerships in terms of those customers to help the end user, the followers, do it. Um, raising money is important for tech. Um, so, we're, again, we're setting up the foundation for that. So, going to get that money isn't as tough. And then, again, building those case studies with those customers and clients and, and so on. And we've been able to do that and we've been able to do it month after month, which is, which is really exciting. Um, people... People, if they want to reach out, have it, have a call. Like I'm, I'm open to jumping on calls and really walking people through the platform and how it works and kind of my whole story behind what I want to do with the company and help with people's businesses. Um, again, like I'm open to anything. It's just a matter of figuring out the best time and the best practices for both of us because your time's just as valuable as mine. I don't think anybody's time's more valuable because we all, we all have 24 hours in a day. It's just, okay, how could we work together and what's the best way of doing it in any, in, in any form and speaking and phone calls and clients and customers and partners, same thing. How can we benefit each other? Cause if we can benefit each other, it'll just, it's just, it's just a stronger relationship because it's, it's about the long term. I don't want one offs here and there because they're, they're time consuming, but if you can form those, those relationships from the beginning, and they can take time, it's beneficial for everybody in the long run. Absolutely. You know, and I think that's actually a really good segue to my last question here. Um, you know, I think especially in untreaded territory where there's high ambiguity and, you know, we just have to make slow gains and small gains, you know, for you, what sort of keeps you motivated? You know, what keeps you inspired on a day-to-day -day basis? Like it's, it's, the customer seeing success in their business. It's the excitement behind them that keeps me motivated because yeah, it's, it's tough. It's, it has been tough, but I wouldn't change it for the world. The stress of customers and clients not coming or collecting money, like all that stress, I wouldn't change it for the world because at the end of the day, if the customer's happy, I'm happy. And getting, getting those messages daily, getting those testimonials, getting all those, seeing the numbers, all that stuff, like that stuff doesn't lie. And that's the stuff that gets me up in the morning. And on top of that, I just absolutely love what I do. Like I wouldn't change it for the world. I would struggle going to a nine to five and working for a corporate company or any other business where there is that, at say higher power. <clears throat> I love what I do. I would rather like people say work 70 hours on my own and not make as much money than go and work 40, 50 hours a week for somebody that you absolutely hate what you're doing. Definitely. I love it, Jeff. You know, Jeff, this has been an incredibly, um, you know, pragmatic conversation. It's been very, you know, humbling. I can tell that you're an incredibly humble guy, you know, as well as super motivating for other people watching this podcast today. You know, so at that, you know, Jeff, we appreciate you jumping on the bot podcast. Definitely. We'll have to have you jump back on in the future. You know, I think it's just going to be a rocket ship of growth for you guys and we're definitely going to be watching your progress. So you know, I, I, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. Likewise. Hey, take it easy, everyone. See ya. Thank you.